concerned about the malaise of the American economy. They understand that our strong dollar is truly a mixed blessing, both a reflection of strength and a cost to many sectors. And from the cabinet table to the kitchen table, fiscal consolidation is the order of the day. This economic story, rich in opportunity, complex in detail, promising for the long term, challenging in the present, is of a piece with Australians' wider experience of our times. Consider our national security. We have a continent for a nation with an enviable diplomatic and military strength in a strong alliance with the strongest democracy. But we recognise the new threats of terrorism, rogue states and cyber attack, while the old threat, nation-state rivalry, never went away. And it's rightly sobering to the national mood when Australians are dying for us in uniform overseas. We had our summer of sorrow as natural disasters here in New Zealand and in Japan transfixed us and left us troubled about how violent and unpredictable our world can be. Yes, these are rich and complex, promising and challenging years. And as for individuals, so for nations. Faced with challenge and change, we can pull the doona over our heads and leave the blinds closed all day. Or we can get up and get our boots on. I know what I'll do. Because we've got a chance now to do something pretty amazing. To take a 150 year mining investment boom and make of it a once in 150 year opportunity boom offering a good education for every child, a good job for every family, good choices and true security for every older Australian. And also providing more information and choice, creating options for communities, citizens, parents, empowering them to insist on better, to insist on productive change. My child, my school, my skills, my uni, my hospital, helping mortgagees to switch banks, empowering regional communities to direct the various instruments of three levels of government in the one place that they call their own. Consider the way our minerals resource rent tax will fund future savings, funding contributions to 10 million sovereign wealth funds in which 10 million Australians make super investment choices of their own not dumping cash into one big sovereign wealth fund controlled by the eminent and the grey. Or the way we'll cut carbon pollution through a well-designed market, aggregating competitive responses on the energy supply side and price-driven consumer choices. Not a giant taxpayer-funded slush fund to pay polluters to do the right thing. You'll see the same approach over time as we work through new ways to extend the fair go to Australians with disabilities, as we consider the best policies to provide reassurances to people with disability and those who love and care for them. It's right to aspire to be a country where disability services are based on people's needs for those services, not the lottery of what kind of disability they have, how they acquired it, or what postcode they live in. Where parents of children with disability know that their children will be safe, well cared for and happy when they too grow old and they're too old to provide that care themselves. And when Australians with disabilities have good choices in their own hands, taking away the barriers to finding work, to being involved and active in their communities. I believe seizing opportunity and offering choice lies at the heart of progressive responses to the emerging social reality of having two senior generations. The ageing of our population is a big new change all over the developed world and I want to discuss it in some length, in some detail today. A cause for uncertainty. People see it in their own lives and they know in part what it means for them. But at the same time, they wonder, what does it mean for the nation? 
and it's an issue people can identify with and they do nominate it as a big challenge when asked. Not least because Australia's former Conservative government saw and said that this, the ageing of our society, was a problem. Now, I don't think the burden theory of ageing is right at all, nor do I think we have a problem of too many old people or a solution which lies somewhere in the population policy menu. I see a change, one driven by wonderful good things, by last century's amazing collective achievements, victories over disease and squalor and want, with rising life expectancy for all. People are living longer than ever before. When Australian Labor introduced the age pension, and I won't tell you what the Conservatives said about the age pension in 1909, but I'll give you a hint. It started with an N and it rhymed with go. I'll let the, you work that out yourselves. But when we sought to introduce the age pension and succeeded in doing so, when Australian Labor introduced it, life expectancy was 57 years, lower than the age at which you qualified for the pension at 65. In the century since, life expectancy has gone up 20 years. Now we've heard that so often, it's so familiar to us, we race over the thought. So for a moment, pause and think about it in your own life. 20 more years to live. All the books you can read, the time to teach nieces and nephews to sing or knit, the time to work with wood or to fish with the grandchildren, the extra day to reconcile with your partners or your friends or your parents. Time to see the Bulldogs win another flag. <laughs> years of productive work, years of volunteering and caring, learning and leisure, and years with loved ones too. It's an incredible change when you think about it. Longer lives, more older Australians, this will never be a bad thing to me. And as people live longer, will have two senior generations. A new group of people are retiring while the already retired are living longer. Over the next 40 years, the over 65 population goes from one in six Australians to one in four. A big change in our lives. But the over 85 population will go from one in 200 Australians to one in 20 almost a new way of living. For now, those two senior generations in practice are the parents of the baby boomers and the boomers themselves. Think of the 90-year-old woman with the 65-year-old son. And that younger senior generation is the healthiest, best resourced and best educated to ever be in this position, to ever stop full-time work. For the first time, there'll be more part pensioners than pensioners by 2030, which tells us both what a significant shift there is to more affluent ageing, but also the limits of that shift. That private wealth will create new choices, while the state will retain a vital role in guaranteeing income and security for all. Not everyone will have a Winnebago or a trip around the world. Many will work hard. Some will share caring responsibilities for frail parents and young grandchildren at the same time. We will not do away with hard times or the long responsibilities of life, but ageing will change. And the baby boomers do bridge a historic change in human life. Their grandparents were born in the 19th century and their grandchildren are born in the 21st. Even 15 years ago, retired Australians had lived through a period defined by depression and by war. Today, people are retiring whose life has been defined by post-war prosperity and the sexual revolution. They're going to want different things not just security, they're going to want choice. They changed what it meant to be young and they changed what it meant to form families and adult relationships.